I did do a little production assistant work. I thought that I like. Uh, it was um, um, I like parts of it. Some parts of the tough long hours, long hours. But uh, what was the what kind of production? I worked on a television show and a movie. Um, yeah, like like Netflix, Apple. Yeah, no, it's, it's standard as twelve hour days. Yeah, and then for me as a director, then I have to go back on all my shots for the next day. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard, yeah. but I do it. I don't. But I do it for the years. Yeah, and now that I don't have to do that, so it's fun. Sleep late. I can stay up late. Bright and shiny. Yeah. Yeah. Are you thinking of doing the work? Um, well, maybe. I am. Um, I'm a little involved. I I lived in New York City for a while, and, and I was involved in stand up, um, like other kids were performing. So I am um, try to do that here as well in DC. Although it doesn't. Yeah. So I think I'm gonna put some more time in that route a little bit of being in. Like the performer instead of um, on set right now. Person I had invest in. Really? Yeah. Well, if you look for them, <laughs> there's a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. But um, there. Mm -hmm. What I was thinking about in your book documentary that I do about climate change and simply sending it as well. I don't know where the name of it is Weather Girl Boats Road. And it's said as a weather man getting a report. And the young woman sitting to his side begins to go crazy because everything he just doesn't pay any attention to the catastrophes. Happening all around him. All I could say, it was so funny. I couldn't stop laughing. I thought, what a great way to engage people. It's so funny. That's very funny. And I tried to find there were schools. I, I never pursued it very far because I think she was unique. Um, she just was. By the end, she kills. She can't stand all the lies that are just. Actually, that's so funny. I should look that up. Yeah. It's called Weather Girl Goes Rogue. Okay. I, was, I used to have a whole set on climate change. How some? Yeah, it's very hard to do. That's why this was just over. Mm -hmm. This is the best I've seen. Yeah. I'm sure you'll be able to find that. I think we should start. I don't I think. Just aren't drawn to hear my stories. I'm really very <gasps> crushed. I don't think that's the case. We had enough RSVPs for the room, but maybe people don't trickle in. I think we'll be just what fine. What's your name? Lily. 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 Yeah. Okay, Lily, you are going to be the artist. I don't like using the microphones anyway. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us here. My name is Shady Rose, and I am the events manager at Lock City Books. Uh, before we get started, please silence your cell phones if they are on. A few things about us, if it's your first time here, or maybe your first time in this week. <laughs> welcome. We are Lock City Books. We are a used, new, and rare bookstore located in the heart of Addison, Oregon. And we specialize in a very carefully curated selection of books. So if you have the opportunity to take a look around our shelves, you'll notice that they're very tightly packed with a lot of titles that we took great care in choosing and adding to our shelves. So welcome and thank you. Really quickly, I'd like to introduce Joyce Chopra. Stand for this part. She's on YouTube. I don't know if you ordered your book ahead of time, by the way, on 
uh, Eventbrite, but if you did, then just let me know. All right. Joyce Chopra has produced and directed a wide range of award-winning films, ranging from Smooth Talk, winner of the Grand Jury Prize for Best Dramatic Feature at the Sundown Film Festival, to the A&E thriller, The Lady in Question with Gene Wilder. She has received American Film Festival Blue Ribbon and Cin Cine Golden Eagle Awards for her numerous documentaries, including That Our Children Will Not Die, about primary health care in Nigeria, and the autobiographical, autobiographical Joyce at 34, which is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art. She lives in Charlottesville, Virginia. Please welcome Joyce. Yeah. Welcome. I know that you wanted to open with reading from the prologue for the book. Yes. Um, and I'm really interested in, in hearing about that. Um, but I wanted to start to, to hear your perspective on why you're here and how this book came to be, why it was important for you to write it. Well, I didn't intend to write a book. That's the first thing I have to say. Um, whenever I finish a movie, I get blue. It's the only way to put it. I don't want to say depressed, but very down because I like to make things. Um, when I lived in Connecticut, I, I love gardening, even like weeding, just, just to make something. So my daughter is observing me lying on the couch and moping. And she said, why don't you write a memoir? And I said, that's ridiculous. I'm not a writer. She said, yes, you worked on so many scripts. You know, you have so many stories to tell. I said, no, I can't do that. And as I was lying there, I said, okay, here's the first sentence. My father was taking such long steps down Mermaid Avenue. I couldn't, whatever, I couldn't keep up with him. She said, that's a very good first sentence. And that sentence is the first sentence of my book. It stayed. So I started to write just to keep myself busy. And I kept writing and writing and enjoying it. I never thought of getting it published. But at a certain point, a friend of mine who writes his me memoirs back on a war said, could you send me the book? And I did. And she said, but she didn't say send me the book. She said, send me what you've written. Because she also teaches at the new school in New York. And uh, she called me up and she said, this is a book. Really? Yes, it's, it's wonderful. And, I, and I'm, if it's okay with you, I'm going to send it to my agent. And she did. And the agent said, this is a book. <laughs> and I'd like to represent it. Um, so I began to take it quite seriously at that point. But until then, I didn't really even contemplate finding a, a publisher for it. Anyway, so that's how it came about. Yes. Thank you. Uh, if you'd like. I thought I, after I had finished the book, I realized I had a place, my situation when I started, which was in the late 1950s, I don't know, 86, and what the world was like for a female contemplating being a director. So I wrote a prologue, which I didn't be. When I was about 22 or so, I purchased a Bolex film camera and never once spared to use it. It just sat on a tripod in the corner of my room, staring at me reproachfully. Becoming a movie director had taken a firm grip on my imagination, but I hadn't the vaguest idea how one managed to do that. There weren't any film schools that I knew of. And even more problematic, I couldn't picture myself in a director's role since I'd never seen a movie directed by a woman. Even the film history books that I collected to educate myself never mentioned a single one. It didn't strike me as odd. It was 1958, and that's the way the world was. I would have been astonished if anyone had told me that a French woman exactly my age, Alice E., was the first person to direct a one-minute movie with actors in 1986 in Paris, or that 20 years later, an American woman, Lois Weber, would become the first person to direct a feature-length film for the newly formed Universal Studios in Hollywood. I would have been equally amazed to be told that another woman I never heard of, Dorothy Arsner, directed major films all through the 1930s, starring the likes of Catherine Pepper and Andrew Joan Crawford. Excuse me, I have to turn the page. Having white begun, began, began. 
Sorry. Yeah. Mother began her own transition into the new world of talkies along with the silent movie star Clara Bow. Miss Bow's fear of microphones was so intense that the prompted Arson to invent the blue mic by attaching a microphone to a fishing pole that followed the actors around the set where she couldn't see it. But none of these accomplishments would be recognized until many years later. I have to say this, I, 1990, I'm talking about. That's, that's how recently this all could have been written. Many years later, when scholars began to uncover women's roles in the early days of movie making, it's frustrating to think that I knew nothing of their work at a time when it would have helped me feel less insane to think of such a career for myself. But even if I had known that other women had once been successful film directors, I would have been dismayed that their success did the last. By the 1940s, when Hollywood became a very corporate world, not one woman could be found sitting in a director's chair, except for the actress Ida Lupino, who survived by forming her own production company and hiring herself. That's a smart idea. Hire yourself. <laughs> anyway, it goes on, but that's the... That's been up at setting the stage for the world I entered in, in 1960. Yeah. Well, I think that that sets the stage really well because it brings to to the to the forefront something that nowadays we take for granted: women in roles of directorship and producers now, executive producing as well. Um, but when you first made your steps into that world saying that you didn't see any other women in those roles. Um, and I'm sure we can think about why that is, of course. You know, it was a different time. Additionally, when it came to film, women were seen as pretty objects to be put in front of the camera rather mm -hmm. than thinking people to be behind the lens. Um, so I wonder what your first kind of thrust into the world of directing was like. And what was the experience that you had when you first took those yeah. steps? I wanted to do fiction films, and that started. Okay, I'm going to back up a little. I I did one of these uh, junior years abroad programs, and I went to Paris, and I became friends with some painters, Swedish painters. I fell in love with all of them. I thought, I thought they were very old. They were probably 25, and I was probably 18 or 19. But they loved. They didn't see movies. They said film. I was, this, I'm talking about 1955. This is how long ago it is. And they went to, a, there's a theater in Paris. It still exists called the Cinematheque Francaise. It's like the Museum of Modern Art in New York or maybe others that, that they show films either by country or by director. And so we would go and look at these movies, be a whole lot of German films, but they would actually analyze them as though they were analyzing a poem or a novel. They took it very seriously. And I, I was just stunned by all this. So it sort of planted something in my brain that I didn't activate until about five years later. But when I finally decided I had to try this, in spite of not having no idea how to do this, I even went to Paris first, because I loved living there um, that year. And when I got there, I had a, a names of different producers that people had given me. And Literally every single one of them made a pass at me. And I don't mean just a pass, grabbing a breast, grabbing my rear, just thinking nothing of it. So I was just for the taking. So I left after about three weeks, totally disheartened with no money left. I spent it all on going there. And uh, I went to New York. And again, I had a list of I don't know, 30 people, you know, that I first tried the television network. I didn't know where to go. That was the problem. I had no idea where or how. And by accident, somebody sent me to uh, Amy, uh, it was a company called Drew Associates. He said, here, uh, somebody on my list that I saw who didn't have a job. He, he was one of the first people who didn't try to make a grab. Uh, and I wandered into this place. And I'm trying to actually try to find that and read it to you. Here I have it. I'm going to read this section. Okay. Uh, okay. I somehow summoned up my resolve to once more find a way into the film business 
even if I had a first detour into television. My first stops were CBS, NBC, and ABC, three major broadcast net networks, since they were the only game in town. When I told interviewers that I hoped to be hired as an assistant to a director of shows like Playhouse 90 or Craft Mystery Theater, they, sat, they sat, stared as if I were from a galaxy far, far away, or replied that if I learned stenography, the same old story, I could name the first spot as a, a secretary to one of their producers. Then if I was really lucky, he, capital H, he, might even allow me to visit a set in his company. It was so infuriating and disheartening. I then remembered that Al Cap, the creator of the popular comic strip, Will Abner, and an acquaintance of mine might be able to help. When I called Al, he said he would be delighted to assist and suggested he would be pleased to provide my advice. I was excited when I arrived. Al was famous, knew everybody in the world, and thinking of him as a friend, I wasn't on my guard. He cordially invited me to sit on his couch, offered me a glass of white wine, and faster than one of his cartoon carriages could yell wham. His hands were all over my body as he, try, as he tried to force his tongue into my mouth. I still remember the smell of his pomaded hair. I doubt I said goodbye as I fled. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip a paragraph. It's about I met somebody who said, you should go to this company who's a bunch of crazy people and you'll fit right in. So there was also a documentary. So I kept thinking, why am I going here? I don't even know what the documentary is. I don't know if you one. So an hour later, found me in a waiting room in a narrow building. I decided to go because I thought, well, at least I'll touch film. <laughs> I was that desperate, all they could put it in my hands. An hour later, found me in a waiting room in a narrow building on West 43rd Street with no one in sight. Eventually, a few people rushed through and I was able to stop someone long enough to ask if I could read the first name in the letter of Mr. D.A. Pennybaker. Finally, Mr. Pennybaker came out looking harried and in a Russian words, I quickly introduced myself with a fabricated story about accidentally losing the film I just made that would show my nascent talent and how I would do anything to work at this company. I doubt he listened, but not knowing how to dispose of me, he said, here, sit down and watch the film we just completed. It's special. The screen dropped down, the lights were turned off, the projector on, and I was left alone to watch primary. The documentary about the recent 1960 Kennedy Humphrey Kennedy primary fight in Wisconsin. Yeah, I'm going to talk about this better than me. I had walked into, without knowing, a revolution in the documentary filmmaking. This is the year that transistors came out. And they, until now, you couldn't have cameras and sound recording on a heavy tripod. You couldn't lift the stuff up. And so, by uh, putting transistors in a camera, a 16 mm camera, you can actually put it on your shoulder. And now you accept it. That's the way films are made now. And this was totally radical. And so they were able to follow Kennedy, for example, on, on stages, down steps, from here to there. And when lights came on, I thought it was normal because that's how feature films are. So I didn't know what to say. I thought an idiot, but they hired me. And I was very lucky because it was so radical. And I worked there for about two or three years. So that was my first job. That's an amazing story. And I feel um, I feel like I was there with you when you described the room and the darkness and the yeah. sort of insane whirlwind of activity uh, leading up to that moment. And, and you also mentioned that the industry, when you reached it, was full of very grabby, you know, men who were entitled and to who were treating any woman they could get their hands on as if they were, as you said, for the taking. Um, I see a tasty too. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so how did you confront that as you made your way into the industry? How did you resist, you know, that culture while also making your mark as a filmmaker? <sighs> Luckily, the guys who worked at this first place, they would tease us, but they, they never crowded there. But it was still wonderful. To, all the assistants were female, all young, and all rather attractive. So that's sells you a lot right there. And there were there were jokes. And we just sort of put up with the side, you know. 
one of them uh, would come in, and this would be typical of him. Uh, and he was trying to challenge it. But he'd pat his stomach. He'd go, oh, I had a marvelous fuck. He was English. I had a marvelous fuck last night. And we were supposed to laugh. I mean, it was just, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, I, I have to say, overall, in, in all the situations I've been in all these years, it's not the sexual advances. That was early on. It was just treating women like they didn't count. You know, that, we, that we couldn't do the job, that we weren't up for it. And I'll leap ahead. I mean, I, in the early 2000s, I was hired, much against the producer's pleasure, to direct an episode of Law and Order Special Victims Unit. Mm -hmm. And it was going into, I think, its fourth season. And they had hired only two women, and, all, and there's about 20 shows per season at least. So you had it all, it was a lot of shows. They had only hired two women in those four years and never rehired them because they were found wanting, whatever that means. And the producer was so derisive towards me and hovered over my shoulder and stopped so that I couldn't do my work. And of course, it ended very badly. I wasn't hired again. And then nobody else wanted to hire me in television because I wasn't. But the good news is that with the Me Too movement, literally three or four years ago at the most, we now have, as I looked up the statistics before I finished the book, like 40% of hires for episodic television are women. And before that, it was 3%. I mean, it, it went like that. Not with features, but with television, yes. Well, that's, that introduces like an interesting angle too, because the things that we see on screen represent the voices that are allowed to have space in the room while producing and directing, the, whether it's the television or the whole film. Um, and so what have you seen over the years since you started up until now as some of the milestones for changing the narrative that we see on screen by changing the makeup of the team behind the camera and behind the production. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's, who chooses the subject? Go back to documentaries. People, there's no such thing as uh, this revolution in the early 1960s. It was called cinema verite, truth cinema, as though by filming, I follow you around. But I choose to, for days I'm filming you, I choose what scenes. So there's no such thing as. The impartial eye, and the same with feature films. Who chooses the scripts? And until now, it's been based on well, it's the men who count. Yeah. And still, all these actions, big action films, are. Right. <laughs> right. But I haven't yet seen uh, the woman. What's it called? The woman sheep? No, I, I, you know what I mean. A woman king. The woman king. Right. I haven't seen it yet either. So. That's okay. okay. There was an article uh, paper yesterday that the New York Times that. The artistic films are not making any money. They're getting great reviews, and the only one that's made money more than its budget is the woman king. This is a big action film. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're thinking of making movies, don't do what I've done. Make an action. Well, that, that brings me to another question, too, about um, some of the trends that you've seen over time, uh, because now we do have so many action films kind of out almost a saturation in, in the market, especially with you know Marvel movies and all of that sort of comic book cinematic mm -hmm. universes and things like that. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on whether or not there is a decline in, in artistic original filmmaking or no I don't think so. You don't think so. No, I don't. There's so many films I haven't seen. And I'm being a little late. Well, first of all, I didn't go to the movies for three years because of COVID. And I'm in a fortunate position. I'm a member of the, the Directors Guild, which is the Directors Union. And this time of year, I begin to get DVDs or online uh, passwords to all these features. So they're arriving now in a flood. Every day I get either two or three on, on my uh, email or they're arriving in the mail. Which is not the same as seeing it in a movie theater, I know. But I'm, I'm part of that demographic that's lazy. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I could see it on my TV show. No, but it's not the same. Yeah. What about you? Do you go to movies? I, no, I don't really. Um, I haven't found myself as interested in, in the movies that have come out lately. The last one I saw in theater was Everything Everywhere All at Once with Michelle Yeoh. Yeah, and, um, I've heard of people and really like that. I really liked it. Yeah. Um, and speaking of, you know, artistic expression and originality in film, I think that was a really good example. Yeah. Um, so then talking again about the films that you have made, um, what what kind of drove the choices that you made in terms of the films, the scripts that you chose when you were making fiction or the subjects that you chose when you make documentaries? What are some of the core values that you you find emerging in the work that you have done? Well, yeah, I think it's well, what started a sort of trend, I guess, at the moment is uh, I became pregnant with what's considered a very advanced age of 34. My mother didn't believe it. She thought she'll never give up her career to, you know, and she said, I can't, I couldn't believe my eyes. Anyway, I was very worried when I became pregnant. By the time I got to be about eight months pregnant, I thought my life might be over as a, as a working woman. Because we're still on here. This is 1971. And I was talking to a friend of mine who is a sociologist. She said, oh, you're in a unique position to do a film about you and your mother to see if your relationship with her will change when you become a mother. I said, do a film about myself? Are you crazy? Who ever heard of somebody? There hadn't been. I started in 1960, so now we're jumping to 1971. All the documentaries that were being made with this new equipment were about public events, politicians, sports figures. Uh, one of them was uh, about a man about to, on death row. Will he be, you know, they all lead to some climax. But nobody had ever, ever done a film about so called private person, especially a woman. How it's crazy. But I said, no, this isn't a bad idea. I'm going to do it. And I got $10,000 from the public television station in New York, WNET. And I saw, I had no money except for that. And I sought out a young woman named Claudia Wild, who uh, could borrow her boyfriend's camera for free. And we proceeded to film for over a year. It's called Joyce at 34. And it starts with my birth, giving birth. And it's still shown all the time. And this is the subject that I did was how do you, how are you going to be with a partner and also be a working woman? And that conflict hasn't gone away. I mean, whenever I'm at a screen, I'm like, why could you advise this? I think nothing. I don't know. You know, I was lucky. I had a husband who was uh, a writer and worked with me. You know, and, uh, we were renting a house that had a top floor that we didn't need. And I had, we were living in Cambridge, Mass, and we had a student at the ed school in a turn for room and board. She got, she worked for a certain number of hours every day. You know, so I was able to work it out. But anyway, that film led me to then do a series of films about women that the idea was to women at different life stages. The first one I did after that was about 12 year old girls. And if they changed or not when they entered a co-ed school, and sure enough, they did. Became boy crazy. Just took them. Just took them. Hormonally blasted, as were the boys. Anyway, so and then Smooth Talk, which is the feature that won the Sundance first prize. Uh, so again, it's about teenage girls. So I guess that's been my big interest. That's a long way of answering this question. No, that's great. That's great. Um, I think it's so important too, right? Because when it comes to women and girls as the subject of any piece of media, um, so often it is men telling those stories mm -hmm. and the lens of, of a man that, has, that all of that is being seen through. Um, so I think it's really important and necessary to talk about this work where um, you're exploring the humanity of, of girls and of women in a way that is a bit more geared towards 
I guess the, the, the truth of, of their expression of that time in their lives rather than applying you know what is usually like a hypersexual lens to, to, to girls and women or um, some other form of objectification or pushing into certain kinds of roles uh, and just observing the, the natural expression of, of women and girls. So thank you for that uh, piece of your legacy. Uh, I'm curious also, and I think we'll, we'll give some time for the questions if you have some or if we have any in our live stream. Um, I'm curious about what you see emerging from contemporary you know, film spaces. Um, something that is there something that excites you about about new new filmmakers or new directors in the scene? Uh, is there some trend that you see that's maybe you interesting or interesting? I've been so absorbed these last months in getting the book published. Um, I, I, I say I was very lucky. Uh, the friend I sent the book to, who's writer, uh, down in agents, and she couldn't sell it to start with. She sent it to all the top publishing companies, and they all wrote back the same kind of, it doesn't fit our list. This is wonderful. We so admire George Trubber's work, blah, 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 blah. But she found one company that was started by a deep poet, Lauren Strong, at a, in San Francisco called City Lights. And they, pr pr they published rather radical books. And they've been doing it for many years. So I'm thrilled that they're publishing it. But the best part is the woman who's now running the company uh, is also a terrific editor. Right. And she helped me to streamline it. I had so many extra stories because once you, I start describing a scene, I find like I get sidetracked by talking about that person's story and that person's story. And she kept saying, this is not your story, it's their story. Let's stick to your story. And it really made a significant change. And so kudos to this woman. Excellent. And yes, thank you to City Lights and Publishing. Um, they have always sent us some really, really yeah. magnificent books. Yeah. So I'm very grateful to have you counted among, among the books that, that City Lights is, is offering to the world. Um, let's take a little bit of time to allow for some questions. And if you're watching from home and you'd like to ask a question, you can type it in as a comment on the video that you're watching right now. And we'll get to that at the end. Um, so for you and your personal experience, was there a time that you felt like you had gotten your like big break and that you like had really made it um personally? Or or was it all sort of like gradual, continuous? You know, um, I think I had a rather dramatic Okay, I'll start over. This film that we're referring to, Spirit Talk, uh, in the last moment I found a young actress, Laura Dern, who nobody ever heard of, to play the lead. I had no, I was two weeks away from filming, and I had nobody to play this 16 year old girl. Uh, and it's a whole separate story how I found Laura, but the film was a huge critical success. I mean, just that you can't fight that reviews for yourself. And so within a day of its being, you know, released into theaters, I was home in Connecticut in the country. I get a call, this is Steven Spielberg, her assistant, he wants to meet you. So this is Diane Pete herself. <laughs> Would you? I have a Larry and Mercury novel I've option. Would you direct it? Jim Brooks, who was produced everything on the world of television also wanted to meet me. And so Tom wrote this, my husband Tom Paul wrote the screenplay and we went out to Hollywood. And I was wined and dined, so to say, by so many different producers, companies. And I chose to direct a film from an, an adaptation of a, of a novel, Bright Lights, Big City, by Jane McInerney. Uh, I won't go into the story produced by a very famous director at the time, Sidney Pollack. And I was fired after a month. And it was a, a horrible experience because much had been made of my being hired. So there were a lot of articles in all the trade papers. A woman got a big budget film 
Michael J. Fox was the lead, or Kiefer Sutherland. And now it was, it, it was unspeakably terrible. I couldn't speak about it without shaking for a couple of years. And I didn't want to ever make a film again. And then I gradually got back into it. A friend of mine was producing television films, which in the early 90s was considered kind of a plus city. They used to be Monday night and Wednesday night movies. I'm both known, so you won't remember this, but it was employment for hundreds and hundreds of directors and uh, script supervisors, customers, you just name it. And with the advent of reality television uh, in the early 2000s, it was cheaper to do those shows. So overnight, a whole industry was wiped out. But <sighs> yeah, and as I said before, there weren't any women working in episodic television, but my agent was connected to Dick Wolf. Uh, he produced all those law and order shows. So he got me hired for one show here and one show there. And I made some good films too, I'm not saying this, but I really went from this is way high to crash, way low within months. Yeah, it was. Read all about it. Yeah. 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 Is that like, do you find that that changed your artistic process at all, or just dealing with something so intense, public? I have to add. Hello, did you want to come in? No. <laughs> um, no, what it changed was uh, the kinds of work I was doing. There's nothing like doing an independent feature. Truly, we have a great producer who's your friend, you know, and everybody on the set is you've hired and they all are happy to be there. And I could never replicate that until years later uh, when I started making documentaries. And I'm still making that. That's again, because maybe because there's not very much money involved in documentaries, but you don't have that aggression that you have. With Hollywood. Would you say that documentary filmmaking has a bit more of sort of like the humility and that human condition yeah. involved? Yeah, that's right. Completely different. But it can compare for me with creating a world from scratch where you um, find the locations where you, you, you tell the story as much as the dialogue. You know, it's just one look at it and you know a lot about the people living there. I hired the costumers, production designers, you know, we work from photos that I find, paintings. And that, that's really exciting. Yeah. And that's why people become like they addicted to making movies. Well, singing in your case. <laughs> it's true. Uh, um, this is a good question. I hope, you know, do you ever see yourself uh, Picking up a large uh, fiction film project anytime soon again. I would love to. I haven't really. I don't think I have the energy to do it anymore. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm this way through my age, and on a film set, the minimum you work in are twelve hours, and then as the director, I would get there even earlier because the actors get there earlier to do their hair and makeup. And I would go around to the trailers where they would say, you have any questions about the script? Okay. And then you go home and you plan shots for the next day. So you're really working 16 hour days. And I don't know how I did it all those years, but I did. And I don't think I could. I haven't tried it, but I don't think I could do it. See, so, uh, I've been thinking about getting into film acting and that's a discouraging number of hours per day. <laughs> yeah, but actors, at least uh, there's a, it's called a turnaround. You must get at least 12 hours as part of the rules and regulations. Whereas directors, no. Because <laughs> you're in charge. Mm -hmm. You know, when you when everybody gets there in the morning and they say, okay, where do we put the camera? I'd be able to tell them. So we have a few more minutes. I want to hear a little bit about a little bit about more about smooth talk and the production um, experience there. Uh, you, know, you said a little bit about you know finding the actor at the very last minute, 
um, yeah. like, can you can you kind of tell the story of that of that entire production and sort of uh, ups and downs and ins and outs and the people that worked with you? Well, I Tom Cole, who wrote me about back up in the world, was a short story writer and a playwright. And there was it used to be a program on public television called American Playhouse. And their aim was back about 10 years, also in the 90s, started in the 80s, also in the 90s. And it was a place for first time documentary filmmakers who wanted to make features, the theater directors who wanted to make features, to give them a shot at it. And I produced a play of my husband's for that program in the first season. So I got to know those people. Okay. They said, bring us something, bring us a script. And I always thought about a short story by the author, Joyce Carol Oates. And it was a scary story, but it always frightened me. A teenage girl who inadvertently attracts the attentions, basically a serial killer who's pretending to be younger than he is. And Optioned it, and American Playhouse was very interested, and they paid for a script, not very much, it's a couple of television, but they accepted it. And they, uh, our total budget since 1985 was 1.2 million. So today that would be more like double that. Okay. But still, it's very little. Everybody had to work for nothing. And um, a producer of Friend of ours came on to be an extra producer and he raised the rest. And he lived in north of San Francisco and he said, I, I'm not being paid either, but could you shoot the film out where, near where I am? And we said, sure, that's reasonable. Because it could be said in any small town in America. And anyway, I had already cast three of the main parts of The, the Dangerous Stranger. Catherine and Tree Williams, uh, and a few others I won't mention here. The main part wasn't cast, and I couldn't find the person to play this part. Every I had every casting director in the country look in, and they read whoever they, the women who the young women read it. She just sounded like a little bitch. I mean, just <laughs> the language. She was fighting with her mother, and I said, "This oh God, no! I, this is a mistake." Well, why am I even trying to do this? I was ready to give up. But I couldn't now because we had gone this far. We were literally less than two weeks away. And I was in the producer's office. I don't know what I was doing. And he was on the phone trying to cajole a friend who was a still photographer to come and do production stills while we were filming. And suddenly he said, don't trust me, you to take talk to Nancy. And I get on the phone, she said, I know her. You know her? I know her. She's walking past my window right now. As though, as though the young heroine, I call it the heroine of the script, was real. Yes. And who is she? And she said, it's Bruce Stern's daughter, Laura, who was 16. And it, she lived on the beach in Malibu, colony in Los Angeles. So Laura was, uh, and Bruce Stern was her neighbor. So Laura was walking on the beach. So. Paul Laura answered, she picks up, uh, and it's, she's playing a song by James Taylor, Handyman. Now, backing up, James Taylor was a neighbor of ours in Connecticut, <laughs> and he had read the script and wanted to do the music. And Tom had written Handyman into the script. <laughs> it was there. So, this is weird. So I fly to LA and yeah, driving to you know her audition to bring back to the people in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And on her stoop, she had a ship stoop, and where the, and she had a postcard of James Dean. And it's also <laughs> in the script, a very postcard. <laughs> and this is truly crazy. And that's anyway, she, she did a reading that was just sensational, and she was hired on the spot. Strange, though. It is. It's almost surreal. <laughs> I had the same experience with the cameraman that I wanted to hire. I had found a book of photographs by a photographer named Joel Myrowitz of Cape Light, and he had a photo of a screen door and a hallway behind it. And that's a major scene in the film. 
is an old house with, with a screen pad. Joel had taken a photograph of the very image that was in my head. And uh, so I made up my mind when I meet this new cameraman, if he doesn't respond to this photo, I won't hire him. This, this is my image of main main image of the movie for me. I call him when I get to the airport in Los Angeles, see if it's where you he said, you just got to get this book, Kate Light. <laughs> I said, you're hired. I don't need you. I don't know. <laughs> These coincidences were very bizarre. There's something so beautiful about that. After all of the, the struggle and strive to yeah. have these things just blossom out of the ether and come together the way that they did. Um, that's, that's a pretty legendary story. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I had some good luck and some not good luck. So. Well, I hope that all the rest of your luck is very good luck. And uh, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Thank you, Shane. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us. If um, if we if people who are viewing from home want to keep up with you, if you have a website, can you let us I know just started one, JoyceChopper.com. But I'm not on any social media because I never have them, and I think it's a little late to start. I'm relying on friends who have some followers. Mm -hmm. Well, people media. like you <laughs> for the bookstore, you must have mailing lists. Yes, of yes. course. Yeah. So, so. JoyceChopper.com. Well, everyone check out JoyceChopper.com. And in the meantime, if you haven't already ordered your copy of the book, you can go on to LaCityBookstore.com and grab a few. We still have some in the store as well. So walk on in and snag a copy. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful.